this morning for God's goodness to us today. Amen. How many of you believe in prayer today? 
Brother Chris Johnson is going to come and I'll share our prayer needs and take us to the Lord in prayer today. God bless you, Brother Chris. Good morning. We had a wonderful Sunday school lesson this morning. <clears throat> Romans 8 and 31 says, they had all, I mean, if God be for us, who can be against us? Right. 837 says we're more than conquerors. Right. And so I don't take prayer lightly. Right. How many of you took what I asked a couple, couple of weeks ago? Take five names. Take yeah. just five names. Yeah. Pray for those five every yeah. day. If your name was on here, wouldn't you want somebody praying for you? Yeah. And so I'm a believer in prayer. They need to pray, and you need to practice. Yeah. And, uh, and so, remember, take this list with you. Put it in your pocket. It doesn't, doesn't take but just mentioning their name. And uh, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. So, so uh, let's remember the Carol Lewis family, the Annette Henley and her one-month-old girl named Heather. The baby's having physical complications. They're in the hospital. Also in the hospital, Mr. Tommy Hosey. And also in the hospital, Norman Rabin. I'm sure some of you are getting Facebook uh, updates on Norman. Norman needs a special touch. Remember Norman. Continue prayer for those battling cancer and undergoing treatment. Mr. Gene Edwards, Ms. Terry Smith, Ms. Pam Valerie, and Ms. Hilda Willis. Or Wills. Prayer for healing, Mr. Carl Creamer, Dick Howell, Gatlin Hardaway. It's a nine year, it's nine years of age. He has a liver failure, and his family asked for prayer for healing. Gracie Harrison, Miss Judy Henson needs a physical touch. Mr. Greg Holloway, Miss Rhonda Jeter is recovering from surgery on the, on her arm and needs a special touch. And Deja Scoggins. Miss Debbie Sitton, Bernie Springer, B.B. Thompson. And also remember the uh, continued prayer for the uh, Ukrainian church. I'm sure this week you saw a lot that took place. People were tortured and put to death, uh, basically martyred. Uh, it's pure evil. And uh, pray that God intervene in their behalf. I, I told our Sunday school class this morning, I said, uh, Jesus told his disciples how to pray. And the first two things he said, he said, Our Father, meaning we acknowledge God, hallowed be thy name. Praise, adoration. We lift you up. Before you ask a need, you need to acknowledge God or who he is. And you need to thank him for everything that he's done. So let's stand. I think that we need to stand and we need to praise God to start prayer off. We need to set the tone because he said he inhabits the praises of his people. It means he, he lives here. God can't answer your prayer if God ain't living around you. So, so let's open up with the word of prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being God. We thank you for being the almighty, the almighty God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending your son to die for us that we might have eternal life. We thank you for sustaining us each and every day. We thank you for loving us. Lord God, forgiving us and showing mercy to us, blessing us each and every day. Father, without you, we're nothing. And with you, we're more than conquerors. Hallelujah. We just worship you and we praise you, Lord God, for who you are and how you have lifted us up. Father, we ask that you would minister to the needs we brought before you today, Lord God. These are battling a cancer in their life. These that need a special touch from you, Lord God. Only you can provide that touch. Only you can deliver them, Lord God. Lord, the doctors are helpless when it comes to certain things, Lord God, but you're the almighty provider. You're the almighty physician. You're able to do exceeding abundant above anything that we ask, Lord God. Bless those. Bless Brother Norman, Lord God. He needs a special touch from you. Father God, his faith has not wavered, Lord God, but he's still believing in you. 
Father God, bless these others. Lord God, bless the Ukrainian church. Lord God, and bless those people that are battling the pits of hell, Lord God. I pray that your hand of mercy and your hand of grace would be upon them, Lord God. Bless this congregation, Lord God, and bless our service that we're about to partake in. Lord, may your spirit be moving and may your spirit be prevalent today. And Father, we ask these in your name and pray and believe and trust in you. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. You can remain standing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you in this house today, Father. We come to lift up your holy name.
Can we lift our hands to the Lord and give him praise this morning? Lift our voices to the Lord and let's give him praise today. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Resurrected Savior, our soon coming King. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you. We bless you. We praise you today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we give our musicians and singers a good hand today? Praise the name of the Lord. Luke chapter 7 is where I want to get my thought from this morning, continuing in the series that we have been ministering on encounters with Jesus. How many of you know that an encounter with Jesus makes the difference. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Luke chapter 7. If you found your place, if you would please say amen. And it came to pass the day after. Now let me just mention what Luke is writing here. When he said it came to pass the day after, he's talking about the previous verses. Jesus had been into Capernaum. And there he had been approached to go to a Roman centurion's home and pray for the, the Roman centurion's servant who was near death. Jesus had been in Capernaum now the next day. This is next event happened. The day after of him being in Capernaum, Jesus went into a city called Nain and many of his disciples went with him and much people. And when Jesus came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the buyer, and they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead set up and began to speak. I'd love to have seen that. Wouldn't that have been interesting? And he delivered it unto his mother. And I like the what Luke writes then in verse 16. And there came a great fear on all. <laughs> Don't you think if you saw somebody rise from the dead, it'd probably make a difference? Fear came on them all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us. God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. Verse 13 says, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. I want to minister to us this morning for just a few moments on the subject, Encounters with Jesus, the one with a broken heart. Encounters with Jesus, the one with a broken heart. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your presence that we sense this morning, the, the spirit of God that we sense in this gathering. Thank you that you are here. I, I sense your presence. Lord, I thank you for the people that have come today to be in the house of God and those that are joining us by live stream. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have for them to be able to be ministered to today as well. 
Lord, I ask of you for the next few moments for the Holy Spirit to anoint me to say what you have put on my heart. Help me to articulate it in a manner that every heart here can understand, can grasp the truth of your word, and we all can grow thereby. Lord, I pray for those in this gathering today whose hearts may be heavy for whatever reason. I pray that you would minister to them today. And we will thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Jesus had left Capernaum and he came into the city of Nain. Nain is in the province called Galilee. Nain was 25 miles southeast of Capernaum. The distance of 25 miles that we would understand would be from where we're at this morning to just about the driver's license office in Mariana on the west side of Mariana. That's about 25 miles. For Jesus to walk from Capernaum to Nain, 25 miles, it would have taken him roughly about eight and a half hours. We're told that... Um, Nain was also about six miles southeast of Nazareth. That's Jesus' hometown. That's where he lived most of his childhood life and to adult life was there in Nazareth. When you look on a map and you see the city of Nain, just to the northeast is Mount Tabor and to the southeast is Mount Moray. And then bordering Nain was, to the south, was the Jezreel Valley. Nain was not really probably a very large city compared to Capernaum, probably even compared to Jerusalem, but there was much activity going on in Nain on this day. For the occasion in Nain on this day was a funeral procession. Family was coming out of the city gate toward the cemetery, which was outside the city. The Bible says the deceased was a young man. He was the only son of his mother. The grieving was his mother. Luke says specifically that this grieving mother was a widow. Now, that may not really catch our attention today, but it was significant then because in that culture, to be a widow was very well, that was a very uh, difficult situation because many women of that day were identified by their husband, and the husband was the provider and the protector of her. Her husband had died, therefore she had lost a degree, had lost a portion of her protection and her provider, but she was still blessed because she had her son. But now what provision, what provider, what protection she had was all gone because her only son, no other son, her only son had died. And she was taking him to the cemetery. The Bible says that there was much crowd that followed her. It is believed from that statement that this woman, though we don't know her name, was a very popular woman in the city of Nain. So we see that this is a circumstance that many of us can identify with when it comes to the death of a loved one and someone we care about. We can identify, we can understand and some of you sitting here, you understand the pain of being a widow, but you also understand the pain of losing a child. But then we have a demonstration that took place when Jesus and the disciples and much people was following him and he was coming into the city of Nain as his funeral procession was coming out and they intersected one another. And the Bible tells us that Jesus saw the mother. And when he saw the mother, the Bible says he spoke to the mother and said, weep not. 
And then the Bible says that Jesus walked over to the buyer, or which was the stretcher. It was known by some as an open coffin, but we would more recognize it as a stretcher on which her deceased son was lying on. And he walked over and he touched the stretcher. Didn't touch the deceased boy, touched the stretcher. And the Bible said they stopped. And then he, the Bible says that Jesus spoke to the young man and said, Young man, I say unto thee, arise. <laughs> and Luke, being a doctor, is very specific in his details. He makes his statement. He set up and he spoke. <laughs> he set up. That would have been interesting, but he spoke. Now, I wish Luke, I really wish Luke would have went in and told us what that mama done. I wish Luke would have probably wrote what the pallbearers would have done. I wish we had a glimpse of what the crowd would have done. That is left for you and I to just imagine, but you know I'm sure this mother went from grief to joy in just a few seconds. I'm sure those Paul bears, I'm sure they had a glimpse of something they'd never seen before of a demonstration of the power of God. The Bible says the fame of Jesus was spread abroad. It was rumored all along and people glorified God. Now when I read this story and I read the, what, I, what took place in history, being one who loves history and being one who loves the Bible and you put both of them together, I would have liked to have been there. But I don't have that privilege. All I have is the opportunity to read about it and use my imagination of what it must have been. As I was studying and preparing for this, I began to ask myself the question, how can this story have any application to us of today? How can this story that occurred 2,000 years ago have any significance for us today? As I begin to study it out and think about it and begin to read a number of different resources and things, I believe the Holy Spirit showed me something here that I believe will encourage us because we all need an encounter with the Lord especially when you've got a broken heart. I dare say everybody in this room at some time or another knows what it is to have a broken heart. Many of us in this room know what it is to have a broken heart for a long time. A broken heart might be an event to some, but it's a journey to most. You with me? Luke writes something very interesting here in chapter 7 and verse 13. He says, and the Lord saw her. And the Lord said to her. Now of all the writings of Luke, now Luke was a medical doctor. Luke was very specific in his details because if you remember back in Luke chapter 1, he was writing to a man by the name of Theophilus who was intrigued, interested about Jesus. And so Luke had gathered much information and so is writing so as to be very specific and detailed to Theophilus about the life and story of Jesus. And he says in Luke chapter 7, verse 13, and the Lord saw her. Notice the word Lord, L-O-R-D. That is the first time in the book of Luke, that Jesus, that Luke uses that title alone. You'll find in many of the gospels it might say the Lord Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ. But here in this specific account, Luke says, and the Lord. He figured that by the time he got to where he was that Theophilus would have probably understood that the one he was referring to was Jesus. 
and he says, the Lord. They're significant about that because that term Lord means one who is master, owner, powerful, sovereign. In other words, this man he calls Lord is in control and has control. How many of you believe Jesus is Lord today? We sing the song, He is Lord. We must believe that from the depths of our heart. We must submit to him as our Lord. He is our owner. He's our master. He is all powerful. He is sovereign. So Luke says, the Lord saw her. What is it that stands out to us about that is that I want to draw some truths about the person of Jesus. It's good for us to be reminded when our heart is broken about who Jesus is. Because in the woundedness of our heart and the grief of our heart and the sadness of our heart and the brokenness of our heart, we can be consumed with what has brought about the brokenness of our heart. And Luke writing says, and the Lord saw her, spoke to her and touched. Now, I want us to look at something real quick. First of all, he uses the word Lord because I believe there's significance here for us to grasp. Number one, Jesus is the Lord of life. He's dealing with a situation. He's writing about a death here. How many of you in this room hate death? Paul says death is an enemy. Death is an enemy. And, and, and if you've ever been stung by death, it hurts. Right? And, and he says, Jesus is the Lord of life. He's dealing with a situation of grief and sorrow. And he says, and the Lord, the Lord of life. Now, I want you to understand this. There is no other religion on this planet who has a Savior, who has a Redeemer, who is the Lord of life. None. There is none who has a savior, a redeemer, or leader who is the Lord of life. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. John 3.15 says, Whosoever believeth in him hath everlasting life. In John chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus speaking to the woman at the well said, if you knew who it was that asked of you water from this well, you would have asked of him to give you living water or the water of life. John chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus said, the bread of God is he that came down from heaven and he gives life to the world. In John chapter 6 and verse 48, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. In John 11 and 25, Jesus said to the brokenhearted Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There are many a man and a woman walking on this planet that might be living, but they don't have Life. Life is when Jesus, you have an encounter with the living Lord of glory and you understand he has the power to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you of your sins, and impart within you a nature that can cause you to rise above the wickedness and the bondages of this world. He is the Lord of life. How many, of you, how many of you believe that today? He's the Lord of life. 
I want you to also understand he's the Lord of compassion. John chapter 7 and verse 13, Luke says, And the Lord saw her and had compassion on her. The Lord saw her and had compassion. Now, you got to remember this now. We are talking about not just a small group of eight or ten or eight or ten people. Luke again is specific. He said, and Jesus and his disciples and much people was with him. There was a large crowd. And coming out of the city of Nain was this funeral possession where there was people around this woman whom they loved. They were walking her out of the cemetery in this procession to the graveyard to bury her only son. And the Bible says in the midst of the great crowd of people, Jesus saw her. Now that says something to me. You and I need to understand that the Lord of glory, the one who's the master, the one who is all powerful, the one who is sovereign, he saw one who had a broken heart. It is so easy for us to think that God cannot see us or does not recognize us or does not have any interest in the brokenness or the grief of our heart. But I want you to hear me this morning that everything about Jesus came. Everything about Jesus unfolded. Everything about Jesus happened because of the brokenness of humanity. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 17 and 18, Wherefore it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining unto God that he might make reconciliation for the sins of the people in that he hath been tempted he is able to come to the aid of them that are tempted. Let me say if I'm going to have someone represent me before God I want some someone that is merciful, someone that can understand, someone that can sympathize. In Hebrews chapter four in verse 15 says, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Therefore let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I have a high priest who is faithful but I also have a high priest who is merciful. He is touched with the feelings of my weaknesses. He is touched with the feelings of my sorrow and my grief. You need to understand this today regardless of your grief. Regardless of the long term of your grief. Regardless how brief your grief has come to your heart. I want you to understand this God who holds the waters in the hollow of his hand who meted out heaven with a span who comprehends the dust of the earth in a measure and he weighs the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance he is a great God he is a big God he is an almighty God he is a powerful God but your grief has not been ignored or denied or neglected by him he sees your broken heart Psalms chapter 34 verse 18 says this, the Lord is near unto them with a broken heart. I said the Lord is near unto them with a broken heart. You say, well, Brother Douglas, I don't feel him. Understandably so. When you're grieving, all you feel is pain. When you're grieving, all you are is overwhelmed with the shadow of that circumstance. You don't feel the normal stuff you normally feel when your heart is a broken. You're overwhelmed. Your heart is split. Your spirit is grieving so you don't feel rightly so but just cause you don't feel God that mean he's not present. He is nigh. Read it yourself Psalms 34 and 18 the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart you may think you're being engulfed by the grief, overwhelmed by the crowd and that maybe the Lord's not seeing in you, looking at you, caring for you. I want you to hear me. I believe the word of the Lord Lord, if your heart is broken, your spirit is heavy, the Lord's eyes are upon you. He's near you. 
The Lord has compassion for you in your dilemma. In your dilemma. But then I want you to notice this. Not only is he the Lord of life, the Lord of compassion, but he's the Lord of hope. <laughs> I was reading this, I was looking at this, and I was thinking, Lord of hope. Lord of hope. My eyes fell on John chapter number seven, or Luke chapter 7 and verse 13 where Jesus saw her, the Lord saw her, had compassion on her and said, weep not. Say that with me. Weep not. Now, when Jesus said to this mother, weep not, he was not rebuking her for her grief. He was not rebuking her because she was weeping. It's normal, it's natural to weep when you're grieving. It's okay to weep when you're grieving. It's healthy to grieve. Jesus said to her, weep not. Now, before I go any further, let me mention this because I, I, I want you to follow me very closely because I think some of you are probably right now, I can just, I can see your brain just going. <laughs> and you're sitting here saying, well, this don't apply to me because I'm in grief, I'm in sorrow, I'm in hurt, I'm in pain, I'm whatever the case may be. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says this. That which was written aforetime was written for our learning. That which was written aforetime was written for our learning that we might have patience and comfort, that we through the scriptures might have patience and comfort, have hope. That which was written before was written so that we might have patience and comfort that through the scriptures we read, they give us hope. I'm going to tell you something. If you lose your hope, you'll never move forward. If you lose your hope, you'll give up and give in. Many a man and a woman have survived the challenges of life because they had a Lord that they could hope in. I want to say this. When Jesus said to her, weep not, this is what you and I can get comfort and, and, and comfort from and draw from and have hope in, is the Lord of hope gives us hope in the present. When Jesus said to this mama, weep not, what he was saying is this. It's okay to weep. It's okay to grieve. But I'm fixing to change the situation. Weep not. Don't stop. He didn't say, don't stop weeping. You ought to get over it. Now, I ain't got to go all your life. Get over it. Don't weep. Don't No, what Jesus was saying, weep not because I'm fixing to intervene. I'm fixing to make a difference. I'm fixing to change your situation. Now, before you shut me out, just a minute, I, now stay with me. I'm talking about the Lord of hope gives us hope for the present. If I've ever seen an hour that we need hope for the present, it's now. I said we need hope for the present now. I've watched the news that those dear people in Ukraine, it is unbelievable at the atrocities, the evil, the, 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 that, that is happening there. Those people, they believe they've got hope, so they're fighting with everything within them. Listen to me, friend. We, we, we need hope right now. I, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on the church. I'm not giving up on the power of God. I'm not giving up on the gospel. I'm not giving up. There's some people who just folded their hands and say, well, everything, everybody's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, let me say something to you, friend. If you don't have hope in the Lord, I can understand that. But I'm here to tell you, I don't have to give up. I don't have to give in. I don't have to quit because I have a living Lord who is the Lord of life, the Lord of compassion and he gives me hope for the present. I want you to listen to what the Bible says in the book of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong 
in behalf of them who put their trust in him. I love that verse. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. In other words, what the prophet, what the scripture is teaching me here is the Lord. Remember, Luke said the Lord. The writer of the Old Testament said the Lord. The eyes of the Lord is running to and fro. In other words, the eyes of the Lord is going up River Road looking for somebody, somebody that'll believe him. And he goes up Butler Road. He goes up Welcome Church Road. He goes up, uh, 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 you know, that one up there. He goes up that road. He goes Highway 90. He goes down Blue Bay Road. He goes down 69 and North 69 and Cypress Grove Dirt Road and Raddick Road and Blue Springs Road. Wherever you live, the eyes of the Lord is a going here and a, and a going there. He's looking for somebody that's broken in their heart. Somebody who's cast down. Somebody who's heavy laden. And the eyes of the Lord is a looking and if you'll believe him he'll give you hope he'll help you now I said he'll help you now our God is a refuge of strength and a present help not a past help not a maybe but right now he's looking he'll go to your single wide trailer he'll go to your modular home he'll go to your brick your block house he'll go to your tent and what will he do he's saying if you believe me I'll give you hope I'll help you and now, hallelujah. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3, verse 12 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. <laughs> you might be caught up in the crowd and in the grief, but God's eyes is on you. <laughs> you with me? <laughs> oh, he's looking for somebody that'll trust him. Because he wants to help him now. His eyes is on in his ears is inclined and you cry. His ears are so sensitive, he can hear the whisper. Jesus. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> He'll hear you. You with me? I, I I like this one verse. I just want to throw this verse in as an appetizer. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. I, I love this verse. This is Simon Peter, pastor. Simon Peter writes about it some 30 to 35 years after his experience when he failed the Lord. He writes in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack. Did you get it? The Lord. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering. <laughs> Woo, I like that word. He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He said, weep not, Mama. I'm going to change this situation right now. God can change your situation, but you've got to believe him to be the Lord. Now, here's, here's, here's this, and I'm closing. I'm wrapping this thing up. Half of you has already left me, and I've got to leave with you, so... If he's the Lord of hope and the Lord of hope is, gives me hope in the present, Jesus also in this story makes mention he is the Lord of hope that gives me hope for the future. I want you to notice there's something here. Don't lose it. Don't, 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 don't get out of sight with it. In Luke chapter 7, verse number 14, Jesus said to the young man lying on the stretcher when he touched that stretcher and they stopped. Notice what the Bible said. He says, I say unto you, young man, arise. Now see, the weep nots for the present. I say unto you, young man, arise, speaks to the future. Jesus spoke to that dead boy and said, Arise. I don't find it anywhere, and if it had happened, I believe Luke would have written it, that none of those pallbearers helped him get up. 
None of them helped him get up. None of them set, helped him set up, and none of them told him what to say. I would have loved to have heard what he said. But he set up on his own, and he began to speak. Do you say, what does that have to do with future hope? Follow me. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus says this. Marvel not, for the hour is coming when all they that are in the graves shall hear his voice and they shall come forth. Those who have done good unto eternal life and those who have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Think of that. I, I, I don't think y'all. I don't think y'all heard me. Now let, let me just say it one more time. It said, "Marvel not, marvel not." But the hour is coming. <laughs> the hour is coming when all of those who are in the graves are going to hear His voice. And notice what He said: "They shall come forth." <laughs> Woo! Here is the hope for the future. Here is the hope for the future, the hope of the grieving heart. You may have had to lay someone you love dearly in the cemetery, but that's not the last time you will ever see them because there's something about an individual who met eternity born again, that the blood of Jesus marks their life. And where they are placed at, whether it is in a casket in the ground or in a urn and you've got them in a closet, regardless, the blood of Jesus knows where they're at. And the Bible says that there's coming an hour, a time, a specific time when all of them who are in the grave are going to hear his voice. Jesus said, young man, I say unto you, arise. And death had to lose his, I could just see him as he's laying on that couch and all the, or that, that, that stretcher, all of a sudden life coming to him, that foot begin to move. <laughs> That hand began to move and he opened his eyes. He opened his eyes. All of a sudden he began to breathe. I bet them old Paul Bears were standing there looking. <laughs> if I let this thing go, I'm in trouble. That mama, she's over there. She's wiping her tears and she's looking. All of a sudden he takes a deep breath. And he opens his eyes and the scripture says he sat up on the side of the bed. And I could just imagine when he did, he looked straight at Jesus and said, I've just left your house. I've just been your house. I've seen heaven. I've seen glory. I know what it is. And death has no power. <laughs> Woo! They that hear his voice. Now, 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 let me share this with you. <laughs> you say, I thought you was quitting. Well, I am. I'm circling the airport. I'm circling the airport. <laughs> don't tell me the scripture don't all tie together. Follow me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Notice what the apostle Paul wrote. And the Lord... <laughs> himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. <laughs> Woo, I'm going to say that again. And the Lord himself, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of of God and notice this and the dead in Christ going to rise first <laughs> Woo! can you imagine can you imagine what
what's going to happen when that takes place. There's going to be cemeteries all over the place. All over the place. Graves are going to begin to burst open. I'm talking people who have passed away centuries ago. Their grave, them graves going to open up. Can you imagine what it's like whenever some of those unbelievers are at the cemetery and they're having a party? You know, that's where some of them go to every now and then. And can you imagine what it's like whenever those in that ground, even though their bodies already decayed, but the blood of Jesus marked where they're at and the spirit of God begins to enter back into those bodies. The same spirit that made man who was dust out of dirt made him a living soul and they're going to come up out of the ground. They're going to give way from corruption to incorruption. And if you've got any of your family in a yearn, you make sure you put them in a place because they're going to bust it all to pieces. And they're going to come. You say, you believe that preacher? I believe thus saith the word of God. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I know some of you are sitting there thinking he has lost his mind. Oh, no, I ain't. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Arise! Arise! And they're going to come up out of the grave. Listen now. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. They're going to come up out of the cemetery. They're going to come up out of your closet. <laughs> They're going to come, come up out of the seas. Because the Bible says that when he comes, he's bringing those who have gone to be with him, bringing their spirit. They have a heavenly body now is going to enter into that body that's been buried at sea or in the urn or wherever the case, and they're going to give way from corruption to incorruption, and they're going to come up out of that ground. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. <laughs> shall be caught up. Some of you are looking at me like, oh, come on. You need to quit listening to all those preachers on TV and start listening to me. <laughs> Some of these new boys preaching, they don't believe in the rapture. I believe in the rapture because the Bible says there's one. Amen. If Jesus died and is still buried, we have no resurrection. But Jesus died, he buried, and he rose again. And because he lives, we shall live. <laughs> Woo. The tower said, go around one more time. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Caught up together. In other words, he told the Corinthians that mortality is going to give way to immortality. Yeah. You hear me? Mortality is going to give way to immortality. That means I'm going to change this suit of clothes for a robe of white. <laughs> Do y'all feel that? I'm just a wondering. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy. Coming in the morning, Nasser. Do you hear me? Joys are coming. It's dark now. It's tough now. We're in grief. We're in sorrow. We're crying. Mom and law, it's difficult. But I'm here to tell you, night's fishing to give way to the rising of the sun. And when he comes, he's going to wipe away all tears from us. Come on. Hallelujah. But the gospel proclaims it. Jesus said in John 14, verse 1, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. 
and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Because an encounter with Jesus gives you hope for the present, hope for the future. Father, I've delivered my heart this morning. Glory to God.